Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, Institute of International and European Affairs webinar. My name is David O'Sullivan. I'm the newly appointed Director General of the Institute, and in fact, this is my first chairing event as Director General, and I could not be more delighted uh, to be doing so with our, our distinguished uh, guest today, Ambassador Hoiskin. I'll come back to uh, him in a moment. Um, he will. Uh, he is, of course, currently chairman of the uh, Munich Security Conference, uh, and he has taken time out from his schedule to discuss today uh, a very important issue of the German foreign policy, particularly in the context of, of Ukraine. He will speak for about 20 minutes or so. We will then move to a Q&A session with our audience, both of which are on the record. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will get to them once we move to the question and answer session. I also uh, encourage you to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag um, IIEA. Let me now briefly say a few words uh, about Ambassador Heusken, who really needs no introduction. He's one of Germany's most distinguished diplomats and also a European diplomat. Uh, uh, he was uh, for, for nearly 12 years the uh, diplomatic advisor to uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, he was also a German ambassador to the United Nations uh, and since retiring has now taken over, if, if that would be the right word, ambassador from Wolfgang Ischiger, if anyone can replace uh, him, it is you uh, as chairman of the Munich Security Conference, which of course is one of the uh, must must go to events, uh, annual events on, on security and, and foreign policy. Um, the theme, as we know, is German's foreign policy, the Zeitenwende, uh, a turning point or more of the same is the question uh, of the of the seminar. Uh, and we I'm certain Ambassador Hoiskin would be absolutely uh, honored to, to hear your views on, on this absolutely crucial subject of, of Germany's foreign policy in the context of the dramatically changed uh, security environment in Europe. Ambassador Heusken, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me, David. It's, a, it's a, um, really a pleasure to be, to be um, with you. Um, as you mentioned um, before, I'm uh, retired from the German Foreign, Foreign Service, um, which I regret in so far as uh, my ambition in life was always to, before retirement, to become ambassador of Germany to Ireland. Um, because my birthday is March 17th, and um, I always wanted to be in the country where this is a national holiday, so I, I didn't make it, but um, I did second best because my first birthday was Chicago. My first uh, posting was Chicago, and uh, I was told that the Chicago 70 March festivities are um, as colorful and um, as um, as uh, how can I say it as liquid as it is um, back in in Ireland. So um, no, but thank you very much for for having me. Um, I was um, as you said twelve years national security advisor or, or diplomatic advisor to Chancellor Merkel, but afterwards I was for four years an ambassador of Germany to the United um, Nations. Um, in interesting time. Um, I was there during the Trump administration, which was a special um, challenge also in the Security Council. Um, but um, then when, when I, I left, um, um, so to speak, Germany handed over its seat to Ireland. And um, I must say that um, Geraldine, uh, Geraldine Bernaysen um, was a wonderful colleague. I love to work with um, um, during the years I was in, in New York and you have a wonderful representative of your of your country um, in, in, in New York. Um, now um, you asked me to talk about German foreign policy, which I'm happy happy to do. Um, and maybe it was intentional that you um, that you didn't ask somebody who is actually part of the government to respond to this question, but somebody who is retired and therefore maybe a bit more, um, open to discuss um, also um, uh, what you have hinted at in the subtitle um, turning point or more more of uh, of the same. So let me let me try to um, uh, describe our uh, the current situation here in in Berlin. Um, we had a handover between uh, Chancellor um, Merkel and. Uh, 
uh, Chancellor Scholz in a way that uh, not many countries have. Um, for Chancellor Merkel, who, uh, as I said, worked for as her advisor between 2005 and 2017 for her. It was very important to demonstrate continuity and to uh, represent also certain stability um, um, in the center of Europe. So um, although it was um, you know, the major um, rival of the Christian Democratic Party, the Social Democratic Party that took over the chancellery, nevertheless for it was very important to demonstrate this continuity. So for instance, uh, um, uh, on her last G7 um, summit in um, um, Italy, she took um, uh, the new chancellor with her um, to introduce uh, him to her partner so that there was a smooth uh, tradition. Now, um, this was all well planned and um, actually the handover um, uh, worked well, um, um, also a lot of continuity. Um, but then um, the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine took uh, place. Um, this was a, a shock for um, Germany, it was a shock for Europe, it was a shock for the international um, community. Um, I must say, you mentioned, David, that I've taken over the chairmanship of the um, Munich Security Conference. On its last day, when I physically took over, that was 20th of February, um, four days before the invasion, I have to admit that I, I still thought that Putin would not invade. I thought that he would not invade because what we witnessed in Munich was something I had not witnessed for many years at that conference, and that was transatlantic or even beyond that international unity in um, opposing um, Putin's declared plans about um, you know, what he about his um, you know his claim that um, there was no right basically of Ukraine to exist and, and his um, crude historic um, um, description of, of Ukraine as a uh, not really having an identity and no um, um, you know, actually basically no right to to exist and uh, there was this very clear opposition by um, uh, by the United States, by all European countries and beyond saying that he cannot do it and if he does it he will be hit with um, very stern um, opposition and sanctions etc. He went ahead uh, anyway, um, he uh, Putin met with this opposition that um, already was lining up in, in Munich. Um, I don't think that when Putin looks at the situation in Ukraine today, um, um, that he will be happy with this situation. Um, I think um, one of the reasons, um, if we um, go a bit into the into a very human direction there, one of the reasons why um, Putin actually invaded, why he ignored what um, was happening outside Russia um, has to do with the fact that basically uh, the guy was for more than, than two years practically isolated. He was sitting in his bunker. Um, he was not receiving um, in personal, for a personal conversation, any um, you know, foreigner or any foreigner who was ready to have an um, open talk with him. And he is surrounded, as it happens very often in totalitarian states, by people who don't, um, um, uh, who not necessarily tell their opinion, but they just, um, you know, present the picture that um, uh, uh, Putin wanted wanted to see. So I think that he was surprised by the weakness of its own uh, of his own army. He was surprised by the strength of the Ukrainian army, by the strength of the Ukrainian identity that has been formed in the last years. Mainly, um, mainly thanks to the to the Russian pressure. Um, but coming to Germany um, again, uh, the twenty fourth of February was a shock. Um, hardly anybody in Germany believed Russia would do this um, when Russia invaded um, Ukraine for the first time in two thousand fourteen and and fifteen. Um, it was in disguise. Um, there were many here who. 
then said, well, somehow Crimea, you know, um, you could somehow construe that it was part of Russia and uh, this is only part of it. And then um, we were able in 2015 to stop the Russian advance through the Minsk agreement. So we were back into negotiations and um, um, uh, we didn't think that um, Putin would just um, um, you know, ignore all these agreements and, and actually ignore with his intervention all um, you know, international covenants um, from the Universal Declaration um, of Human Rights, the Charter of the UN, the um, CSC Founding Act, the NATO, um, NATO Russia Founding Act, the Charter of Paris, the Budapest Memorandum, and I can go on and on and ignoring everything, no respect for international law, and um, then um, invading invading Ukraine. It was a shock for, for the country. Um, and it was, of course, quite a challenge for the new government that had been in office only for, um, for a few weeks, actually. And um, the, the chancellor, um, three days later, on the 27th of uh, um, February, gave a speech in the parliament which um, I think one, one um, I don't want to have an inflation of using this word, but was a historic speech because he broke with a tradition um, of German foreign policy, a tradition in particular of um, uh, foreign policy um, of the social democrats by clearing, uh, by clearly calling a spade a spade, calling out Russia's aggression and um, um, clearly pointing at the consequences um, for, um, uh, for Germany, and that is the now uh, total change in, um, in our security and defense uh, policy by now uh, finally actually adhering to the objectives set by NATO um, uh, in, with regard to the 2% of GDP um, for defense expenditure. Um, also, um, you know, everything that German politicians actually from both aisles had said before that Germany would not do, um, he over the weeks turned around 180 degrees everything from um, you know exclusion of uh, Russian banks from SWIFT, uh, from suspending Nord Stream 2, from delivery of, of um, um, arms and including now uh, delivery of, um, um, of heavy weapons. Um, in the um, international, from the international perspective, probably in Ireland as well, Germany was seen of, of lagging, lagging behind. Um, and to a certain degree, that is true that Germany was um, lagging, lagging behind. But in the end, you know, most of these um, packages, including now, including now the latest one, the embargo on oil and oil products, Germany is uh, joining in. It has to do a lot with the with the fact, as I said earlier, that the Russia through the invasion um, destroyed um, the. Um, the, the policy of many, the beliefs of many in Russia um, destroyed a lot of um, how German foreign policy should be should be um, uh, conducted. And um, while um, I think one was clear also in in, uh, broad, uh, in almost all parties, everything that we have to react um, harsh and we have to turn around politics, it was. Um, for some, you know, against their DNA. You know, I mean, um, you have to understand when you when you complain about um, sometimes the reluctance or uh, Germany lagging behind in taking some of the decisions, and that some of the basic assumptions and um, basic um, you know, um, components of German um, German foreign policy had um, actually been been destroyed and. Um, um, you have to understand um, where some people come from, um, those who look back at German history, at um, uh, the fact that um, in the Second World War, Germany was responsible for 27 million um, um, debt among the um, population of the then Soviet Union with, by the way, a lot in, in, in Ukraine. Um, 
so Germany has this historic um, uh, guilt. We then also, in a um, in retrospect, in a um, period of weakness, Germany was reunified. Um, re um, if um, Putin had been in power, I don't think that we would have had reunification. It was thanks to um, uh, Gorbachev, a weak president, but he was ready at that time also you remember this perestroika, etc. the opening of Russia, we were in a good moment where also our Western allies all agreed, um, where, by the way, we benefited also by um, what Germany in previous year had done on the one hand with the integration to the West, on the other hand with Billy Brandt and others in uh, um, clarifying our relations to the East, recognizing post-war borders, etc. So, out of this feeling that somehow we owe the Russians some things, we have been, um, um, for many um, uh, proponents of that policy, what happened in Russia made it, uh, in, in Ukraine, made it difficult then to, to, turn, um, to turn around. Um, there has been this turnaround. Um, um, when you ask, is this really a turning point or is it more of the same? Um, yes, there are retarding um, um, factors. Um, we will see that um, in um, when it comes to budget negotiations, when it comes into the Defense Council, um, also our um, Defense Ministry admittedly is not the fastest in carrying through armament programs. Um, there will still be some hesitations and discussions, but um, um, my prediction is that um, through this shock, the, the shock waves that Putin sent to Germany, also uh, the resistance to um, putting the money um, into the defense budget to actually um, uh, purchase um, the weapons that we badly need, I think um, this, will, this will happen. Um, with regard also to a reorientation of foreign policy, from me, it is clear, um, and I hear this also, that um, there is no way back to a um, normal relationship or any relationship with uh, um, Vladimir Putin. Um, as I described before, um, the um, violation of international law um, to an extent that um, we have not witnessed um, in a long time. Um, therefore, I think a return to the status quo, a return to having um, normal nations to normal relations to Putin and Putin government is excluded from uh, my, uh, from my uh, perspective. Um, so the question more of the same, I don't think it will be more of the same. So we will have this isolation of Russia. We will have a, a, um, a more uh, spending in the defense um, keep, uh, in the in the defense um, area. Um, I also believe, and but there I we have to make more question marks that um, what Russia has done will give new impetus to uh, the development of a common foreign and uh, security and uh, in particular defense. Policy. I think there will be um, a push to go into this um, direction. Um, how far will this go? I am not sure. Um, what is clear is that what the European Union will, de will um, build um, in the coming months and years in terms of European defense, um, it will be clear that this can only take place under the um, uh, umbrella of, of NATO. We have seen uh, um, around this time around how uh, uh, how clear um, um, how clear President Biden was when you look at the means that are spent now in support of Ukraine. It's again the U.S. who pays the biggest uh, bulk of it. So there is a return of the U.S. to to Europe. And um, I think this will um, um, there. I think we will um, uh, we will continue to follow follow this, and and strengthen um, um, first our defense forces within EU, but doing everything also to strengthen um, NATO. So that will follow. We will with regard to the energy dependence. Yes, we are slow. We committed mistakes in the past that. Um, 
our exposure to um, um, Russian energy was too high. Uh, you have to understand that you know um, um, energy corporation or pipeline corporation or the corporation in uh, in in fossil fuel and even beyond um, were kind of um, uh, um, the basis for our relations, um, where we say um, always um, handel. Uh, wandel durch handel change through trading um, there was a, a a belief that by you know inter um, interacting by um, you know, having trade also we we created actually chancellor schroeder did that created this so-called um, uh, petersburger dialogue the st petersburg dialogue which uh, puts uh, which used to um, um, uh, um, assemble um, representatives from politics, from um, defense, from um, uh, then also civil society, from from youth, um, uh, and this uh, was established. And uh, we also thought by just interlinking um, economy more, politics, civil society, youth, um, there will be a rapprochement that we will get um, closer together. This all has proven wrong. Um, while I believe it was right to try, it has chosen to, it has um, uh, uh, gone in the wrong direction. Um, and um, as I said, uh, to work with Putin in the foreseeable future um, is, from my perspective, excluded. What does this mean for German policy? I think that we will need now, after the re election of President Macron, maybe one still needs to wait for the outcome of the parliamentary elections, but I think we should use this beyond a revitalization of the transatlantic relations to also reassert ourselves as um, um, as the European Union. Um, we have to be ready for a moment for a crisis where the US would say, uh, listen, this is your job. You have to resolve this crisis. We will not um, send our troops or, or support um, to a certain degree um, to a, you know, um, to what would be theoretically feasible in a conflict, but ask for Europe to take up, to pick up the bill. If the Republicans come back, this will be even more the case. We all, of course, still are um, afraid of a repetition of uh, Trump won. If Trump wins or somebody like him wins the elections where he basically um, didn't commit to Article 5 of uh, NATO, um, um, and, and this is, of course, a, a nightmare. Therefore, um, while uh, really investing in transatlantic unity, investing in Democrats, but also Republicans for uh, the case of a government change, I think we also have to think in terms of um, worst case scenario, which also then means to really build up Europe. Um, talking about European sovereignty, um, I um, believe that this is a bit um, exaggerated because we see right now um, in this conflict without American forces, we would not be able to um, and the uh, resilient to leadership. It would have been difficult to counter Putin as we are doing. So um, um, I think we should do everything to strengthen that. We should um, work within the European Union. Um, and there um, we know the difficulties, um, we know the possibilities of reinforced cooperation, um, we, we really have to step up to the plate and see to it that also in the European framework our, um, our troops are ready to, to, to intervene. The question is how much um, France that is calling for this strategic autonomy um, how much they are ready to actually um, export or have the, um, the European Union take over and see as part of our defense the um, French nuclear powers. Um, I think that's an issue that will come up. Um, I will always recommend to do this very carefully because um, um, you know, the force de frappe is a um, a consequence of the very frustrating Second World War. And this is something that de Gaulle already said must not happen to France again. So it's a pretty much um, a national weapon. At the same time, um, talking about uh, Geraldine, um, she will have witnessed in her first year that um, within the Security Council, 
it is difficult to promote European um, um, ideas, uh, to have the European Union give speeches, to um, have um, you know all speak as European on one line. It has again a bit to do with our friend friends for whom the membership in the Security Council, the permanent membership, is something special, something where they for them it's very important, something where. Um, you know, also the kind of greatness of the nation is somehow reflected in this permanent seat. So um, I was not able and my other colleagues were not able to actually have then in the Security Council, um, have our French colleague or one of the other EU members in the Security Council speak in one voice for the European Union. Um, it is for the individual countries so far. The African Union, by the way, does this regularly. They have three countries in the Security Council, and they, on many occasions, they agree that only one country speaks, and then referring to the African um, African uh, Union. So um, I wanted to um, also um, come back. Um, so Europe, we have to do more. Um, there is one point which for me is very, very important. Um, when we look and interpret the present conflict, we tend to say that the West is in war with Russia or what could be the repercussions on the West. Um, the West has to assume such and such um, you know, responsibilities. I um, strongly advise against using the expression of West because while we all, um, you know, across the channel um, within Europe, um, we are following more or less the same view. We say clearly who the aggressor is, and we clearly sanctions and marginalize. And when you go beyond Europe, you'll find a much more differentiated way. You find many countries that um, highlight um, not what is happening in Ukraine, but highlight the consequences, which is increased food prices, increased um, energy prices, inflation, and uh, they just want to get it over with. They don't care if it's Ukraine or um, is Ukraine responsible or Russia. They just want to get it, um, get it um, ended. And um, um, this is something that we have to, to cope with, to see that countries are affected by you know, the, the repercussion of the conflict and not necessarily go into a principle to way. Um, what does that mean for, for us? I think we have to do much more lobbying and engagement with countries outside the European Union that are not um, necessarily joining their forces with us. I think uh, it is important that we reach out to, to, have, to continue to have um, a, a, a majority in the General Assembly, because if we don't have a majority there, it can happen that resolutions are adopted under the leadership of, of China in particular, where we are not um, um, uh, satisfied with the substance at all. But if they have a majority, if they have bribed, so to speak, too many, um, that many African or Latin American country or, or um, Asian countries, we are all um, all of a sudden in a in a, 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 a minority there. And therefore, we have to go beyond the expression West. We have to defend the international rules-based order. The, we have to um, respect the UN Charter, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because these are not um, uh, European values or transatlantic values, these are universal values. And I think that's very important that we um, then remind people that the invasion by Russia of Ukraine um, is um, not um, you know, seen as an attack on NATO. It is seen as an attack of the rules-based international order of binding resolutions of the Security Council. And by um, pointing fingers at that fact, I think makes it also easier to, um, to maintain this uh, majority that we have in, uh, in the UN. If you go too much by the West, you know, these double standards from Iraq to Grenada and, and Panama and, and others will be raised uh, against us. Um, I would like to, to close with a bit the expectations that I have for um, for German um, politics. Um, I hope that they uh, behave the way I demonstrated it. 
there is one aspect which is very key for us as I said before you know this um, uh, not talking about the West but the rules-based international order I think we have as Europeans Germans um, in kind of a um, um, you know, uh, complementary relationship. Um, we have to be much more active in third countries outside the European Union. We have to increase the. Maybe we can we can um, actually establish European um, embassies. Um, I'm a bit doubtful uh, if we succeed, but in any case, our countries have to invest a lot in in Africa and Latin America and Asia. Um, to actually be present there, to um, present a counterpart to the Chinese embassies, which are filled by, um, you know, sometimes hundreds of, of people. And they, of course, then have larger leverage in their host countries um, when they can, with their companies, with their influence, can go to the president um, of a given country and tell him, listen, this isn't this, um, we are ready to build, um, you can either pay us or you know, you, you, we will make long-term contracts, um, which may turn out um, um, having China take over part, part of um, territory and, and its own sovereignty. So we, they, we have to, they have to be, they have to be capable. We have to do more. We have to talk to countries that we believe are um, somehow on track to implement the international rules-based order where you have a, um, division of uh, powers and I think we need to go into these uh, countries and heavily invest by really having joint joint forces because this is a global contest and uh, we must not be complacent in seeing we have a wonderful unity now countering um, Russia in Europe no we have to go beyond and lobby um, lobby out outside I think this will be um, this will be extremely, extremely important. David, I would like to leave it at uh, this right now. I'm very happy to continue to talk about details if you want me to, if that is not too boring about a coalition built by three parties and how are the dynamics and uh, what can they achieve and what not. But I leave that up to you and your um, and those participating in this seminar. So um, thanks again for having me.